Disfrute de la magia del séptimo arte. Movie Magic. Siga con HBO Ole. Siguiente es un programa apto para todo público. Hollywood has always had a passion for signature shots, those brief but remarkable scenes that stay with an audience long after the screen goes dark. With the ever-increasing popularity of big-budget action films, directors are pushing the special effects envelope further on every movie. Cut. Coming up, we'll join Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage as they break into The Rock and see how DreamQuest Images is helping director Michael Bay create the film's most spectacular action. We'll escape to the future of L.A where miniatures and computer-generated imagery combine to depict the big one, a mega earthquake that turns Los Angeles into an island. And we'll witness how a crack special effects team destroys the famed Rainbow Bridge at Niagara Falls. Unforgettable imagery for the action-packed climax to the long kiss goodnight. These incredible images are celluloid works of art bearing the imprint of the special effects masters who created them. Next on Movie Magic. In the action thriller, The Rock, stars Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage break into Alcatraz prison. Their mission? To stop a group of disgruntled Marines from launching lethal nerve gas missiles at San Francisco. Perfect. Good. Yeah, I want pressure. That's what I want. Give me more pressure. Come on! Director Michael Bay and producers Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson, who collaborated on Bad Boys, teamed up again with the intention of blowing the audience away. I'm a very visual director and, you know, I demand the most of what my film should look like. I want it to be something that places the viewers in places where you're not really privileged to see. I like really involving the viewer and getting right in there on the action. The film's first signature shot will come at the climax of a destructive chase through the streets of San Francisco, where a cable car is blasted 20 feet high, engulfed in a spectacular fireball. The film crew has blocked off a section of street, and the cable car is positioned over two hydraulic rams, which will launch it into the air. Bay chooses seven different camera angles from which to cover the explosion. With the cameras set, the street is cleared, and the crew members take their place. Ready and action! After successfully completing the cable car explosion, Bay turns to visual effects supervisor Hoyt Yateman and DreamQuest Images in Simi Valley, California. We were called upon really pretty much toward the end of the production to fill in that whole bottom area with fire and to remove most of the mechanical rigs that were used to actually do the stunt. Yateman and his digital artists duplicate the existing flames captured on film and position them beneath the cable car. The result is an explosive moment that sets the film off and running. Oh, no. But this is only the beginning. Bay is saving his best shots for later in the movie. The film's finale will rely heavily on digital technology. The script calls for five F-18 jets to come screaming over Alcatraz 
and drop one bomb as Nicolas Cage desperately tries to call them off. Michael told us what he wanted to see. So we took that information and we brought it back here to our stages at DreamQuest and re we recreated the San Francisco Bay Area and took cardboard cutouts and did a video animatic, which is basically a moving storyboard. Michael proved that. Next, the crew shoots a stand-in for Nicolas Cage, signaling with flares. This becomes the background plate to which computer-generated or CG F-18 jets will be added. Using an off-the-shelf software program called Alias, digital effects supervisor Dan Delu creates a simple wireframe animation of the jet's flight trajectory. You'll start with the jets far away and you just block in the basic motion of what the jets do. As the shot progresses, as it evolves, you start putting more and more subtle movements into the jets, the sense of weight as they accelerate into the climb, um, the chaotic nature of a shot like this when they pe all peel off. In these early tests, the jets appear to fly through Cage's stand-in rather than over him, but they accurately portray the path of the planes for director Michael Bay's approval. 3D artist John Murray is in charge of rendering the final F-18s. He works on a single jet, which will later replace each of the wireframe aircraft in a given scene. We went and we photographed a full-scale mock-up of an F-18, which is the, the jet that's used in the rock. And what that gave us was kind of a template to draw from because all of the uh, individual panels were all drawn out on this jet. Murray starts with the wireframe. He takes the wing of the plane and brings it into a program called Studio Paint, where he applies texture from photographs of the mock-up. And here is our wing texture that we brought in. So we can actually go and apply that to the geometry itself. So we're actually kind of laying it on like a sheet. To further enhance the illusion of reality, Murrah looks at the wing from every angle and decides where to digitally paint in weathering and dirt. The fully rendered jet is ready to replace the wireframe aircraft in the shot. The animators add exhaust trails, and the finished scene heightens the tension of Bay's explosive finale. For the second part of the sequence, the crew starts with an aerial background plate of Alcatraz, photographed from a helicopter at 2,000 feet. In order to get the proper scale and angle for the pyrotechnics, Yateman employs the tallest construction crane in Los Angeles. Gasoline bombs will be exploded on top of a 70 by 70 foot blue screen as the camera is rolling from a height of 170 feet. The blue will later be digitally removed in the computer, leaving only the explosion to insert on the plate of the island. The film is sent back to Mura at DreamQuest, where the images are composited or combined. The digital artists apply interactive lighting to simulate a shockwave on the island. Once the animation is approved, the fully rendered jet takes the place of the wireframe replica. As a final touch, the DreamQuest team adds rippling exhaust heat waves and a reflection of the explosion in the pilot's canopy. I think we get excited about the shots as much as anyone else does when we look at them and we kind of get into it and say, let's make this the coolest thing we can, you know. So I think it's positive energy that makes them exciting for us. And um, I think those moments are the ones that we kind of live for. Hoyt Yateman and the team at DreamQuest Images have used a palette of visual effects to compose the rock spectacular finale. And their work of art is on the screen. Coming up, effects artists ignite a fiery finale for director Rennie Harlan's The Long Kiss Goodnight. Go! In director Rennie Harlan's action adventure, The Long Kiss Goodnight, Gina Davis plays a government assassin. The climax of the film finds her on the Rainbow Bridge at Niagara Falls, Cut. which is about to be destroyed in a toxic explosion. 
our uh, hero and heroine are trying to escape uh, from this explosion and are desperately driving down the bridge in their car when this happens and the explosion happens right behind them the sea of fire is going to be following them and it's going to travel down the bridge and destroy everything on its way we uh, attempted to get the bridge shut it down and blow it up they didn't look lightly on that so we've had to build this scale miniature which is a fifth scale miniature 3,000 miles from Niagara Falls in California WKR Productions is constructing a replica of the real bridge the miniature is divided into three sections the two end sections which are designed to withstand the explosion and a breakaway middle section a 10-person crew at WKR designed and built the bridge in two months. The finished miniature is 136 feet long, 21 feet tall, and 16 feet wide. Once the bridge has been assembled on location, a quarter-scale miniature tanker truck loaded with explosives and a radio-controlled car representing the hero's escape vehicle are placed on top. Both were built by Grant McCune Designs. Veteran pyrotechnician Richard Helmer is the person responsible for the bridge's fiery demise. His crew carefully loads the miniature with five black powder bombs and 25 gallons of gasoline. What we're going to do is we're going to blow the tanker, blow the cab of the truck, and this explosion is going to propagate right behind the car. Also, the only reason this bridge is blowing up is because of this toxic fuel tanker. And so uh, I want the whole explosion to pretty much look like it's just like burning right through the bridge. Having designed the pyrotechnic wiring for the bridge, Helmer pays close attention to his diagram while rigging the miniature. He will trigger the explosion from a distance of 300 feet using a pyrotechnic ignition device called a nail board. Those 25 uh, charges will be fired about this speed. As the pyrotechnics crew wires the bridge, the camera crew is busy positioning and protecting the 12 cameras that will record the nighttime event. As the zero hour nears, the crew prepares to flood the area beneath the bridge. We're going to put some water here in, in this pit so we get some reflections from the water and, and some of the debris will be falling in the water and so on. It will be very, very nice. When the set is almost ready, the crew gathers for a safety briefing. We're going to need everyone back behind those berms. You can't stand on the berms right here. You have to be uh, pretty much in front of that white trailer there. It's safe. The crew does a final check, and the set is locked down. Harlan, Oaken, and the rest of the crew check video monitors to see how the explosion looked to the cameras. The bridge is gone, as you can see. It was perfect, it was big, it was fiery, it was rich, and uh, a lot of debris went this way and that way. It hit right behind the car as the car was getting off the bridge. Huge fireball chasing down the car. Million dollar shots. And Danifo, much less. With the director satisfied, Oaken breathes a sigh of relief. So, Richie Helmer, the pyro guy, the model guys, they pulled it together, they did a fantastic job, they gave us more than what we wanted. A heart-stopping conclusion for the long kiss goodnight. Conceived in the mind of Rennie Harlan, created by Oaken and the effects team, and delivered on the big screen. Coming up, shake, rattle, and roll with Hollywood's special effects masters. Fourteen years after the character of Snake Plissken made his screen debut in Escape from New York, director John Carpenter and actor Kurt Russell are heading west in John Carpenter's Escape from L.A. The story takes place 17 years in the future on the island of Los Angeles, where excommunicated citizens are sent for their crimes of immorality. The island was separated from the continental United States 
by an enormous earthquake. The awesome task of destroying L.A. was given to Mike Lessa and his team at Buena Vista Visual Effects, or BVVE. To achieve John Carpenter's vision, Lessa has decided to create the city's destruction using two techniques, miniatures and computer-generated imagery. John wanted the four-level interchange coming down. He you know, figured, you know, a miniature really is the way to do that, and it has to be big. Couldn't, couldn't be a small miniature, so we chose to go quarter scale just so this thing would have, have enough weight. Lessa contracted John Sturber and his company Sturber yeah. Visual Network to construct the film's miniatures, including the 25-foot-tall freeway interchange. We had to work with lighter materials to hold something that big up. Uh, we wanted a lot of fiberglass, we did a lot of mold, we carved everything, we molded everything, and we used a lot of breakaway concrete. And we also had, oh, about 10,000 feet of handmade rebar in there. A crew of 20 designed and built the interchange and remote control traffic over a period of 12 weeks. To provide realistic earthquake-like rolling movement, the miniature is designed with a pneumatic trolley system it uses air pressure to slide each column back and forth and up and down. Before collapsing the miniature, Lessa decides to test how the shaking will look to the camera. Mike Lessa wanted to really see um, the motion from the earthquake. He really wanted to um, put on film the, that fear of, of things moving around you. Satisfied with the trembling and initial debris from the interchange, the crew prepares for its total demolition. Inside each column, Sturber places a special effects device known as a weak knee joint. Triggered by a pyrotechnic charge, these joints will ensure that the columns collapse one by one in a predetermined direction. The moment has come. Knowing they get only one take, the crew starts the interchange rolling. Lessa and visual effects executive producer Harrison Ellenshaw check the video playback to see how the miniature performs. Oh, yeah. That was great. That's better. Yeah, it really did. It'll be good. Another challenging miniature shot in the earthquake sequence involves a gas main explosion in front of L.A.'s Union Station. The plan was always we would make a miniature of the entrance to Union Station and with, with the gas main explosion in it and shoot live footage at Union Station, compose together. The biggest challenge of that was to have it absolutely match the real Union Station in one quarter scale. Sturber's crew creates everything from scratch, from hand-painted tiles around the arch to luggage carts, benches, and garbage cans that dress the front of the miniature. Underneath the model street, Sturber places small hydraulic rams to buckle the ground, as well as charges for the gas main explosion. The miniature is flanked by two large green screens. Like blue screens, they will allow Lessa to digitally extract fire or debris extending beyond the ends of the miniature and still composite them with the live action plate. After some last minute detailing, the crew clears the area and the cameras roll. Checking the playback, yeah, it looks very, very good. Lessa is satisfied that he has what he needs. The footage is brought to BVVE, where he will put the elements together. He starts with the live-action plate of Union Station and adds the miniature explosion element. Due to the model maker's precision, the two shots composite seamlessly. The last element of the earthquake sequence is the demolition of the Bonaventure Hotel. Due to the size of the building and its all-glass surface, it was determined that a convincing miniature would be too large and expensive. So Lessa has decided to demolish the Bonaventure 
in the computer. For this assignment, he turns to his digital animation supervisor, David Jones. Jones and his team have created the Bonaventure Hotel in 3D, but not as a whole structure. The interesting thing about the model is we couldn't just put it together as a single unit, as a finished Bonaventure Hotel, as you'd see it walking down the street. We had to basically pre-score, as it were, every single piece of glass and debris that was going to fall out of that building because they were all going to animate separately. So instead of seeing five cylinders when you look at the building, you see 10,000 little tiny pieces of glass that all fit together perfectly interlocking to form the complete Bonaventure. With great attention to detail, the animators add reflections of the surrounding buildings crumbling to the Bonaventure's glass surface. When the effect shots are cut into the film, they comprise the essential elements of a massive earthquake that sends L.A. out to sea. It's a business of illusion. Escape from L.A. is filled with illusion, and hopefully the illusion will be so real and so good that you'll be invisible and that you'll say, it's crazy and it's, it's far out, but it's somehow that seems kind of possible. It took John Carpenter's vision and a top-notch effects team's ingenuity to create these breathtaking signature shots. With technology constantly changing and the need for big screen action increasing, special effects artists are hard at work using tried and true techniques along with state-of-the-art tools to realize the director's vision. Whether filmmakers need to firebomb a national monument or destroy L.A. in an apocalyptic earthquake, the handwriting is on the wall. When a signature shot calls for movie magic, the masters of special effects are always ready to sign on the dotted line. conocen límites. The Extremes, Los Extremistas, Sigadon, HBO Ole. Este fin de semana, la razón y la pasión se ponen a prueba en HBO Ole. El sábado, Richard Dreyfus y Emilio Esteves pierden más que un tornillo. Al acecho. El domingo, Bruce Willis y Jen March. La pasión y la locura tienen el color de la noche. Este fin de semana, la razón y la pasión se ponen a prueba en HBO Olé. Imagen. Movimiento. Sonido. Y claro, color. Viva la experiencia. Y nuestra invitación para que usted disfrute en compañía de los suyos de lo mejor del cine en la comodidad de su hogar. Viva la experiencia. El placer del buen entretenimiento para cada uno de los integrantes de la familia. Así pues, honrenos con su compañía. En esta temporada, HBO Ole lo invita a experimentar el mejor cine. HBO Ole, viva la experiencia. Hey, somebody's up there. I'm Looks 
like we got two shades of lipstick over here, gentlemen. Seems to me somebody's missing from the party. What are Benny's chances of surviving a second transplant? Well, if Benny survives the operation, he has a 50-50 chance of living a year. I did everything they told me to do. Every operation, every test, every medicine. I did it. Benny! Mom. I'm dying. It is his desire not to receive treatment. Custody was given to HRS. El Derecho de Ben. Estreno martes 15 de abril. Solo por HBO Ole. Simplemente lo mejor. La infidelidad. I don't suppose you're going to tell your husband either, are you? Aaron did. Nunca pensamos caer en su juego. How did you find me? Sin embargo, a veces decidimos correr el riesgo. And at that moment, I understood why people have lovers. Because it makes the everyday things all of a sudden seem sort of magical. Laura San Giacomo es Nina, y ella busca un amante. Nina takes a lover. Estreno viernes 25 de abril, solo por HBO Ole. Simplemente lo mejor. Era la noche de brujas y ellas habían regresado. Con el más diabólico plan. We must find the book, brew the potion, and suck the lies out of the children of Salem before sunrise. Opus Focus. We need it. Una espeluznante aventura. The book is bound in human skin and contains the recipes for her most powerful and evil spells. Oh, come on. It's just a bunch of hocus pocus. <laughs> Hello. Goodbye. Este mes por HBO Ole, simplemente lo mejor. Ellos oyen All of a sudden, I heard a lo inexpresable. I saw my, my partner, he was going forward like this. It was the most horrible, horrible thing I had seen. Ven. She had been raped and sodomized and stabbed several times. Lo inimaginable. She was 81 years old. Most police officers don't get killed by a bullet. Piensa. They get killed by their mind. Lo inconcebible. <laughs> Un programa exclusivo de America Undercover. Policía de Memphis, Guerra en la Calle. Estreno, martes 8 de abril, solo por HBO Olé. Todos los martes HBO Olé le revela una verdad asombrosa. Todos los martes en horario escolar, los mejores documentales exclusivos de HBO Olé. Recuérdelo, todos los martes en horario estelar. Este fin de semana, la razón y la pasión se ponen a prueba en HBO Olé. El sábado, Richard Dreyfus y Emilio Aceves pierden más que un tornillo al acecho. El domingo, Bruce Willis y Jen March, la pasión y la locura tienen el color de la noche. Este fin de semana, la razón y la pasión se ponen a prueba en HBO Olé. Ellos no conocen límites. The Extremists, Los Extremistas, siga con HBO Ole. El 
siguiente es un programa apto para todo público. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Reese, and I was wondering, what is extreme? What is it that drives us to ascend the preconceived barriers of human accomplishment? Are there in fact limitations to our strength, endurance, and human adventure? During the next half hour, the answers to these questions and more will be explored by the men and women known simply as the extremists. This week, we'll meet some extremists who dare to look Mother Nature straight in the eye. Then, we'll hit the track with three professional drag bike racers whose goal is to go 160 in six seconds or less. All this and more coming up on The Extremists with Gabrielle Reese. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Reese, and today I'm hanging out with America's greatest ski team here in Florida at Cypress Garden, the water ski capital of the world. Garden, they have everything from barefoot runs to daredevil jumps and the one and only four tier human pyramid. And today I'm going to get to find out how tough it really is to perform some of these stunts. Those ballet classes are really paying off. Here to teach me a few tricks of the trade is world-class barefoot water skier Jennifer Caleri. Jen, hi. Hi. And look, hair drying off. Tell me about your barefooting, because I mean, you, you're a world-class you know, pro and champion. How do, how do you have time to fit that in and do these shows? Um, I've been competing since 1981. Um, I've been a member of the U.S. team since 1988. And uh, basically, it's kind of like juggling. I mean, I went to school, I worked at Cypress Garden, I trained on the weekends and after work and after school, so. A lot of times when people come to the gardens, they just see the show aspect, and they see us out here in beautiful costumes, and we make it look really easy, and they have no idea the training that goes behind it and the millions of times we run through the dance routine and go over everything. So, Gabby, you ready to go and try it? Um, you know, Jen, I gotta tell you, I've just been having this incredible deja vu. And you know, it's like affects my neck and my whole entire body. So I think I'm just gonna wait a little while longer. But maybe you can take me out later. All right. Okay. Great. Be right back with Gabrielle Reese and the Extremists. And they teach you no matter what, even if you wipe out, come out of the water, just like that. As you know, barefoot is absolutely extreme enough for me. We just got three guys here who have literally built upon that concept. Human bridal? Is this what your trick is called? That's right. It's called the human human bridal trick. Okay. Now, buddy, as you we know, this is what we talked about earlier. Why you're so so buff? Because so brawny. you're the human. The, I'm the human bridal. You're the human bridal. Exactly. A friend of ours, Frank Chandler, came up with the idea. Hey, let's instead of one person out there, let's put two. So we did. You know, I got out there, hung on. These guys got on my ankles and uh, skiing away. I think you guys are a little nuts, though. Uh, and that's why you have all this padding in that's here. That's it. And padding in the in the rear, and these suits are great. All right. Well, our next extremists, they're not exactly walking on water, but they are looking Mother Nature right in the face. And what they're hoping for is some really adverse weather. Take a look. Sector brings you the cutting edge. Step into the world of no limits. For decades, tornadoes have been destroying property and taking lives in North America. Until recently, early detection systems have been slow to warn and prepare communities in danger. With the advancement of Doppler radar, satellite pictures, cellular phones, and camcorders, tornado chasers are now able to warn the public and learn more about Mother Nature's most violent storm. 
For Tim Marshall, Gene Roden, and Carson Eads, tornado chasing is a hobby. I first became interested in tornadoes back in 1967. The day was April 21st. A tornado came right through our subdivision. And the next day, when I went to school, only a few students showed back up. And I found out that some of them were injured and one person was killed. And that had a lasting impression. Now, today's technology is on the information superhighway. And we are trying to keep up with that. And in order to do that, we have to have computers that are in the vehicle. In Carson Eads' vehicle, we've got a laptop via cellular phone that we can download weather information from a weather data service. In Gene Roden's vehicle, we have a satellite dish. And this satellite dish is able to beam up to a satellite orbiting over the Earth. And we're able to download satellite photographs that are occurring hourly. When I see a tornado, it doesn't matter how many tornadoes I see. Each one is different. I am always mesmerized by that. And it is awesome power. You want to stay clear of it. You don't want to get too close of it, but at the same time, you've got to just stand there and go, oh, God, this is incredible. Absolute power coming together right before you. Something uncontrollable. Whoa! Oh, yeah, look at this. I got to go forward or backwards? I have to go forward. Okay, Gene, stop, 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 stop. You're okay, stop. I'm out, I'm out the door, I'm out the door. The National Weather Service knows about this tornado now. It's moving on off, it's going through open farm fields right now. Picking up lots of dirt, debris. Chasing tornadoes is an extreme hobby. Uh, you're talking about uh, rain so heavy that you can't see hardly your hand from your face. You're talking about baseball, softball size hail hitting the vehicle. You're talking about very high winds that are trying to blow your vehicle off the road. And flooding uh, is very hazardous as well. Those are greater hazards than the tornado itself. While tornado chasing is a hobby for Tim Marshall, for Chuck Doswell, a meteorologist at the National Severe Storms Lab, it's a way of life. Well, to give you a feeling about uh, a tornadic thunderstorm, which typically is what we call a supercell thunderstorm, they produce the energy equivalent of about a one megaton thermonuclear device roughly every 20 minutes or so. So these are titanic energies involved, and it's, uh, it's almost impossible to conceive how much energy is, going, is being expended by the storm. Tornadoes are not all the same. In fact, it can be argued that every tornado is a unique entity of sorts, a unique process. They range quite widely in terms of their intensity. F0 is the weakest of tornadoes. But at the other end of the scale, the so-called F5 tornado, the most violent tornado, have wind speeds of approaching 300 miles an hour. And most people can't even conceive of the kind of damage that a 300 mile per hour wind can do. Well, the Pampa Day, we started out in uh, south central Colorado, and we had a long drive to make. And we got into the Texas Panhandle, and we discovered that there were thunderstorms developing. We drove into Pampa looking to intercept the storm, and while we were there, essentially it just happened right in front of us. We were roughly between a third and a half mile away from it, and you could see very clearly that the damaging winds were confined to a very small zone near the tornado axis, and yet the air was filled with flying debris, which was falling out. We were probably as close as a block or two to that zone of falling debris. I believe that what we are doing is extreme in the sense that there's extreme danger associated with it. We're professionals, we've studied these storms, we know basically all there is to know about tornadoes and tornadic storms, and as a consequence to that, we've minimized the risk to ourselves. 
we're dealing with Mother Nature and we can't always predict exactly what she's going to do. We don't have a death wish and we can't always predict which way a tornado is going to move. They're not as erratic as some people seem to think they are. But uh, that we're in the path, we're getting out of them. We have no desire to get caught in that kind of mess. It's just 